is Kelsey Kauser and welcome to The Vine Online, a new digital community focused on worship, prayer, and encouragement. At The Vine, our mission is to do church differently by sowing faith in new places, growing faith in new people, and showing faith in new ways. And we're so excited to get through that with you right now, no matter where or when you might be watching us. We believe that gathering with other believers is important, but when circumstances prevent that, digital worship is the next best thing. But you're probably noticing the screen between us. Well, we need your help to overcome that barrier. So make sure you look in the description of this video and click the link that says Connect Card. Provide some basic contact information there so that we can know you're watching and also so we can reach out and connect with you. We'd love to hear your story and give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have about the vibe. Now, we want to invite you to get comfortable wherever you are, take a deep breath and focus your heart and your mind, and let's worship our God together because He is worthy and His Holy Spirit unites us no matter where we may be.
needless to say, it doesn't take long for this peaceful and serene garden that God has created to be interrupted by a villain. I mean, every good story has a great villain. And the story of the garden is no different. There's a snake in the garden. And we continue reading the scriptures, we realize that this, this serpent, this tempter, uh, has a lot of different names and takes a lot of different forms. We see names like the enemy or the deceiver. Sometimes we even say the, we even see the proper name Satan. And the word Satan uh, simply means the adversary or the opposition. That's what the word Satan means. And the writer of Genesis doesn't really seem to make a big deal about the presence of the snake. I mean, it's one of the, one of the things that jumps out to me when I read this is there's this beautiful serene garden and then boom, all of a sudden there's a snake. But the writer of Genesis seems to just kind of move right along. The story just keeps going. And we have questions, don't we? Why did God allow a snake in the garden in the first place? No answer. Where did the snake come from? What is its goal? The text is silent. And many of us might think that there is no place for the snake in the garden. After all, when God created the garden, he affirmed that it was good, didn't he? He said it is good. So we might ask ourselves, well, then why is there a snake there at all? And to that question, we have to remember something that the scriptures actually affirm over and over and over again. It's that, yes, the garden is good, but that doesn't mean it's safe. You see, in the creation that, that, that God makes, goodness and safety are not the same thing. Yes, the garden is good. That doesn't make it safe. The presence of the snake in the garden actually teaches us something really interesting about God's story. And it's something that we would do well to learn now before we really get into a lot of uh, the rest of the story. Uh, and that is simply that the universe is complicated. A lot of times there are things in the world, there are things in our lives that shouldn't be there, but nevertheless they are. The Bible is not some sitcom, okay, where every single storyline uh, comes to a, a nice, neat conclusion at the end where all the characters smile and, and jump into the air into a freeze frame looking into the camera. That's not how the stories of the Bible go. That's not how they, they end up. The universe is complicated. There are things in our lives and in this world that shouldn't be there. And that's pretty frustrating for many of us, I think, um, because I think if we're honest, we, we really love simplicity, don't we? We like clear answers. We like bullet points and bottom lines. We want, we want the Bible to give us black and white answers on all the issues that we think are important. But the Bible's not really interested in giving us black and white answers. No, the Bible's interested in, in teaching us how to have wisdom to live in a world of gray. And while we may be uncomfortable with that, we don't like that. But while we may not like that, the Bible really doesn't seem to have a problem with it. And in fact, the Bible seems to go out of the way to frustrate the reader quite a bit. Right? The Bible's just sitting there talking about this beautiful garden, this serene place, this, this wondrous creation. And oh, by the way, there's a talking snake. Anyway, moving on. Now, I'm not sure I have to say this, but. Um, I'm going to anyway. Uh, I think it's really important that we remember that ancient people knew quite well that snakes and all other animals, for that matter, did not talk. I mean, it's not like people back then uh, lived in like this Disney movie where they had all these talking sidekicks and, and wizards and flying carpets. Like that's not that's not what ancient people thought back then. No, when they read this story, they recognized how absurd it was for a snake to talk to Eve in the garden. They thought that that was pretty absurd and, and, and pretty silly as well, just like you do. But that wasn't the craziest part of the story for them. And it shouldn't be the craziest part of the story for us either. You see, the craziest part of this story isn't that a snake talks to Eve. It's that Eve talks back. Eve actually engages the serpent in conversation. When asked, did God really say? Eve didn't walk away. She didn't tell the, the snake to be quiet, to shut its mouth. No, what did she do? She actually responded. She engaged. 
Did God really say that you would die if you ate of that particular tree? And when Eve responds with hesitation, that the serpent doubles down on her doubt. That's not what God really said. That's not true. God's, God's actually threatened by you. That's what it is. God's threatened by you. He's holding back on you. He's not giving you the good stuff. He's a killjoy. He's, he's an oppressive father. You see, at the heart of all temptation, not just Eve's temptation, but ours too, at the heart of all temptation is the question, is God really telling me the truth? Does God really mean what he says? Is God holding out on me? Is the way to eternal life really as narrow as God says it is? Is it really fraught with sacrifice like God says it is? Or is it something less costly? Maybe there's a shortcut that I can find. Maybe there's a way I can make it more comfortable. You see, every sinful action, no matter what it is, it begins with this desire for us to be our own God. It's what, it's what Josh says in the book, long story short, it's what he says. It, it begins with questioning God's goodness, and it ends with wanting God's job. That's how all sin starts. That's what temptation ends. It begins with questioning God's goodness, and it ends with wanting God's job. So Eve takes a little longer look at the tree, and she notices that the fruit uh, is delicious. It looks delicious. It's, it's beautiful. She even notices that it's desirable for gaining wisdom, and so she eats it. And then tasting of the fruit, she gives some to Adam, and he eats. And when they do, sin enters the story. Now we should make a point here um, that when the Bible talks about sin, from here on out, when the Bible talks about sin, it's not primarily talking about sinful actions. No, rather, sin is a condition that affects the entire world. That's how the Bible actually talks about sin. And that that condition that we're all in in the world, not only us, but all of creation, it leads to sinful action. But sin itself is more like a force that affects all of creation. This is why the Bible can talk about how creation itself is yearning to be freed from the burden of sin. It's not because, you know, trees and, and flowers and, and donkeys have committed sinful actions. No, but there's this weight, this, this, this pollution of sin in the world that is weighing down creation. It's through this one simple action of Adam and Eve that the entire creation is polluted with the effect of sin. And this pollution um, actually has some consequences with it. There's actually some pretty significant results of sin in this world, and we can see these, right? We talked about, um, in the last video, we talked about how God created the entire cosmos in the garden and all living creatures to live in this holy and loving community with Him. And we talked about how within that holy created order, there existed these virtues like obedience and compassion and communion and truth. And all of these things were marks of a good creation. And we can start back with this uh, question of of why there is a snake in the garden in the first place. And it's an interesting question, isn't it? It's an even more interesting question if you think about what the serpent says, because the serpent doesn't really lie to Adam and Eve. No, the serpent tempts them, but it doesn't lie. Rather, the serpent, the tempter, tempts them to act in a way that is contrary to God's command. You see, if obedience is to be a component of God's good creation, then there must be a certain amount of freedom that exists in the created order. In other words, if it, for, for it to be true obedience, there must be freedom to obey and freedom to disobey. There must be a freedom to obey or rebel. Because God can't force you to obey. If God forces you to obey, that's not true obedience, that's coercion. True faithful obedience must always include the freedom to obey or rebel. And it seems to me that a likely role of the serpent in the garden is to tempt Adam and Eve to disobey. To test them so that they actually have an opportunity to be obedient. Why? Because obedience is a virtue in God's created order. 
This is the same kind of role that, that Satan, the adversary, seems to have in the book of Job. If you remember the book of Job, the story of Job, when he asks for God's permission to go down and what? To test Job's faith by taking everything away from him. So maybe that's why the snake is there, to give Adam and Eve an opportunity to be obedient to God's word. But we all know what happened. They were not obedient. They rebelled. They thought they knew better than God. And, and that's the same sin that we fall into ourselves over and over and over again, don't we? You and I know this is true, that we have time and time again, we have the opportunity to obey God's word. But what do we do? We choose to rebel. We choose rather to disobey. You see, the story in the garden, it's not just a Bible story. It's our story. It's not just true because it's in the Bible. It's true because it happens in our lives every single day. Another consequence of sin is our tendency to look toward our own interests above the interests of others. We see in the garden that God commands humanity to steward over all creation, to care not only for one another, but to care for the birds and the animals and the plants and the oceans. And you might say that this, is, this was an outward posture. That Adam and Eve were called to look outside themselves and to care for things outside themselves, to, to really concern themselves with the needs outside instead of their wants and desires inside. This is true compassion. To place the needs of others before my own wants and needs. But of course, when sin enters the world, we quickly notice that our focus becomes less about others and it becomes more about ourselves. So we develop this inward posture where our focus is curved in on our own wants and our own needs. It's about us. Back in the fourth century, uh, this doctor of the church, St. Augustine, said that our will becomes incurvatus in se. And that's a Latin phrase that literally means to be curved in on itself. See, in other words, God creates us for compassion, but when sin enters the world, our compassion is deformed into corruption. Our outward focus is turned inward on itself, and we begin thinking more of our own wants and needs instead of first considering the needs of others. We, get, we quit treating others like people, and we begin to treat them like products. Products to be used for our own selfish consumption, which quickly leads to a breakdown in our ability to have true communion with God and one another. I mean, you kind of see how there's a domino effect of all these, right? You know, the, in the last video, we talked about how creation was made from communion and for communion. That's the entire point of God's creation. And yet when sinner, sin enters into the story, we quickly see that barriers begin springing up not only between us and God, but between us and one another. You know, probably the clearest example of this we see is that when Adam and Eve realize their nakedness for the very first time, right after they sin, what's the first thing that happens? They realize their, neck, their nakedness, and they craft clothing for themselves uh, out of fig leaves. Now, don't overlook that, right? Now, that's just like a silly little, little part of the story that we, we kind of gloss over a lot of times, or we snicker at if. If you're like me and you're, you know, in your preteens, you snicker at them being naked. They realize they're naked. How can they just now realize they're naked? That's weird. But you see, Adam and, Adam and Eve's focus was exclusively on the other. They were so focused on the other that they didn't realize their own nakedness. That's how much they weren't focused on themselves. But sin enters the story, and all of a sudden they realize their nakedness. They begin thinking about themselves, and more specifically, what other people might think of them. So they make coverings for themselves. And when God finally finds them, right, because they're hiding, they're putting up that barrier between themselves and God, they're hiding, God asks them, who told you you were naked? In other words, who told you to focus on yourself? more than others. And so slowly but surely they began to choose isolation instead of communion with God and others. And we still do that today, don't we? And many of us would rather hide and choose isolation than to risk being truly known in a meaningful way. Now, I can totally understand why. Look, I get it, friends, because for many of us, right around the time we open ourselves up to other people, that's right around the time that we get hurt by other people. 
So in a way, it's a safety mechanism. Not in a way, it is a safety, safety mechanism. We would rather be isolated and safe than be truly known and run the risk of being hurt. But just like we did in the garden, too often we confuse goodness and safety. No, it's not safe for you to put yourself out there in order to be known by other people and to truly know other people. It's not, it's not a safe thing, but it is good. It is good. It's risky, and it can hurt. I'm not diminishing that. It can hurt. But friends, it is good. It is good for us to do that. You see, when sin enters the story, the risk the risk becomes too great, so we choose isolation over communion. Even though we are created from community and for community, we still choose isolation over communion. And that's because sin has left a lasting burden of shame on the world. And we talked about Brene Brown's definition of shame in the last video, that shame is the fear of being unlovable. But it's actually deeper than that. Because Brown goes on to, to make the point that guilt and shame are, are often seen as the same thing in our culture. Guilt and shame are often conflated. They're made, made to be the same thing. But they're actually very different, she says. She says that guilt says, I've done wrong. And that can be a helpful emotion um, when it's nurtured the right way. Because it can draw us back to repentance from whatever that uh, wrongdoing was. The guilt says I've done wrong. Shame is, is a lot deeper, and it's different. Because where guilt says I've done wrong, shame says I am wrong. I am wrong. But friends, here, here's where the deceiver begins to work, because we must remember that God calls his creation good. You need to hear that truth today. Set aside the shame that says that you are wrong and listen instead to the truth that God gives you that says, no, I created you good. God's word can be trusted because God's word is true. We must remember the truth that our God has created us in his image to love him and to live in holy communion with him throughout all eternity. Yes, there is sin in this world. But at its core, God still says, no, my creation is good. Yes, you are a person polluted by sin, weighed down by the burden of sin, but God still calls you good. You are a child of God marked with his holy image, and all of creation is his holy temple. And God will not give up on his creation. God will set right all that has gone astray. The writer and theologian G.K. Chesterton said that the fall is the only encouraging view of life. Isn't that interesting? Think about that. He says the fall is the only encouraging view of life because it holds that we have misused a good world and not merely been entrapped into a bad one. See, evil does not belong in God's creation. It isn't that evil should be balanced or, or minimized. No, evil shouldn't exist at all in God's creation. So how will God eradicate that evil? How will God purify the world from this pollution of sin? How will God begin to set right everything that has been warped and corrupted? Well, we actually get a hint of that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is such an important verse. This is what the early church referred to as the Proto-Evangelion, the, the first gospel. So we had, before we had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we had Genesis 3.15. Before we had Jesus of Nazareth, we had Genesis 3.15. You may not have noticed it. You may have read right over it. But here in this short verse, we see a promise of God's salvation even in the midst of of the horrific consequences of the fall because God curses the serpent and says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now that is coded language, I understand. 
that seems mysterious and prophetic. But as we continue in this long story, you will see how more and more of it is meant to point to the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, there is a snake in the garden, but one day that tempter, that deceiver, that serpent will be crushed under the foot of one of Eve's offspring. Now, how will that man come about? How will he defeat the serpent? And how will he purify all of God's creation? Well, to learn more about that, you'll have to watch our next video. We'll see you then. Amen. Hey friends, my name is Amanda Worthy, and I'm the Community Coordinator for The Vine. At The Vine, we believe our worship isn't over until our neighbor is served. So we want to take just a few moments to encourage you to take some time over the next few days to put your faith in action. This week at The Vine, we collected canned goods to donate to our local neighborhood pantries here in Centerton. If you're local to Centerton, we want to encourage you to find a pantry near you and make sure that it is stocked with plenty of food. If you're not local to Centerton, do a quick Google search to find the food pantry nearest you and make it a point to donate something this week. We pray that God will bless you as you love and serve your neighbors this week. As always, if you would like to learn more about the Vine or our mission to do church differently, don't hesitate to reach out through our website or find us on social media. We'd love to connect with you. Again, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.